can't hear me, just stand up and cheer. No, no, no. Well, it's good to be back in California, especially good right now, as you probably know. We, we got hit with a snowstorm uh, last Saturday, and I flew away last Friday. So I was so happy to go, and I just been, I've been looking at the weather to see what's going on, and I guess there's another storm barreling down on, on the east coast as well. So I can't tell you how happy I am to be here with you today. The weather's been beautiful. A little windy. I went out for a walk on the beach yesterday, and I'm, I'm still, I had to take a shower, this, another shower this morning to get the sand out of my hair. It was really blowing out there, but it's so beautiful to be here on the West Coast. I, I left a little early this year because Father Mike's going to take some time off, and I always encourage him to take time off so I can come and replace him. <laughs> Father, you need some rest. <laughs> got to rest up, Father. So he took off, and I, I came in to help out this week. So I'm here for a little bit longer uh, than usual. And as, as you all know, I come out here to visit with my family. My brother lives in Lake Forest, and so I'll go out there, and I'll, we, sometimes we'll go out to dinner and uh, get a nice steak someplace, and then we watch Hallmark movies because they really like and you don't have to worry too much about Hallmark movies. I know they're all the same, but at least you're safe. You don't know what you're going to get. So we always have a, a, a lot of fun, and that's what we were doing. So uh, when I came out on Friday, last Friday, I went, uh, my, my nephew who lives in San Juan Capistrano called and said, uh, why don't you guys come on out here for dinner? So we went out. And uh, a bunch of family members joined us up at his place. And one of the things he was saying was, um, he said, you know, Uncle Bill, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really worried about our freedom in our country. And I thought, oh boy, we're not, we're not going to start our dinner on that note, that's for sure. <laughs> and he really was, he really was, was worried about um, our country and our freedom. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of fear. I, I was going through the internet, I'll tell you about that in a moment, but I was going through the internet and uh, I was wondering what are people are afraid and uh, Pope, uh, um, who was it, uh, our, our recent Pope, Benedict XVI, uh, said to a group of seminarians, I was reading one of, his, one of his talks on fear, he said, don't be afraid of the future, don't worry about the future to the young seminarians. It's all part of God's plan. And so I thought, uh, well, Angie asked me if I would talk about fear. So I, I went through my materials, and I couldn't find anything that I had written on fear. I, I don't know why. I didn't have anything written on it. And so I decided that I would wait until I got to Father Michael's condo, and I would move in on Sunday afternoon, and I thought, I'll, I'll sit down, and I'll, I'll get the Bible and the catechism, get a nice big cup of coffee, get my laptop, and then I will begin my talk on fear. So I sat down, and I opened up the catechism. That's always a good place to start. And I looked up fear, and there was nothing there. It was one little word, fear, and then one reference. And I looked it up, and it was a tiny little paragraph with about two or three sentences. And I thought, that's it? And so right under it, it had fear of the Lord. I thought, okay, that should be good. And there was one reference. And I looked that up, and it was just two or three sentences. I thought, oh my Lord, there's nothing in the catechism about fear. It's just hardly there. So I knew that I had my work cut out for me. And I began to think about fear, and I began to pray about it. And, you know, I was thinking about what my nephew, Michael, had said, worry, fearful of the country. And then I was going out for a walk with my brother, and I've shared this with you before. I was here at Christmas time for a few days, and I shared the same story. As you know, my brother has six kids. He had six of them, and then he had 
three all together, a set of twins, and then 11 months later he had another girl. So that's called Irish twins up in, in New England. Three little girls, all within 11 months. And so my brother and his wife were, were kind of worried about this. And so one day, my brother was visiting with a classmate of his from college. And uh, they had remained friends all these years. And his classmate was a Protestant, and his wife was very, very active. Uh, practicing Protestant lady and so they were visiting and my brother brought all of his six kids with him and his wife and this woman who is my my brother's friend's wife you know welcomed them into the home and she picked up the newborn the little girl her name is Holly and she picked her up she was probably a couple months old and said to her, the little baby, she said, you are a gift from God. Now my brother, who was going through a very, very difficult time, he thought, how am I going to deal with six children? He had three boys that were older, and he had three little girls, all the same age, pretty much. And he was worried, and he was fearful. And he said, when that woman said, you are a gift from God, my brother tells the story, told me, he said, all his fear just went away, just like that. It just drained right out of him. And he said, oh, this is from God. This is from God. Well, if this is from God, then I'm going to be all right. I'm, I'm going to be fine. And it went away. And I think that's the key to the whole gift of faith. See? My brother didn't have to work himself up or conjure up a bunch of faith or a bunch of hope or a bunch of charity. It came over him. When he heard those words, he recognized right away the word of God, that this little girl is a gift to him. And he said, my fears, my worries, my anxiety drained, and they never came back. They had six kids, put them all through college. He's still alive. I can't believe it. And he still has some money. The money will all be gone. But he's doing quite well. And that little girl is a therapist. And she, she is a very successful therapist. She had a, um, a little um, business right here in Carlsbad. <laughs> and the company she was working for, the, uh, the husband and wife, had this counseling business, marriage counseling business, that she was working for, got divorced. <laughs> so... <laughs> So she had to leave and start her own business, and so now she has her own business, and she's doing very, very well. And so she's, and she has faith, and she raises her children in the Catholic faith, and she married a good man, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's for another day. But the point is, she turned out to be a real gift from God. And who knew? Who knew? Beautiful, beautiful um, story from my brother. The point is, my brother had the gift of faith. And that is given to us at baptism. So everybody who's baptized receives the gift of faith. And it's called the theological gift, which means that um, God injects into our soul, right, into our soul, faith. And faith is the work of God in our hearts, helping us to believe. So it's God's work helping us to believe. And so it's not something that I do, it's something God does in us. And this is where you gotta watch out when you're watching people on TV, televangelists talking about faith. They start start thinking, you you gotta have faith. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Faith is a gift, it's the work of God. And it's there to console us and help us and guide us. And it helps us to believe that what God is saying is true. See? 
uh, and helps us to recognize God speaking to us. Like my brother heard this woman say, you are a gift from God. He knew, he knew that was the word of God. And when he heard it, it triggered, it, it released all this fear in him. And it's the work of God. And the God is at work in your lives right now, in mine, telling us, don't worry. I, I know it's hard. I know. And I'm with you. And this is part of my plan. I know it's a mysterious plan. We don't know it, but it's okay. I'm there. I'm with you. And when we respond to that, which I'll talk about in a moment, he helps us to believe it. He helps us to trust in him. And he helps us to love. And so these three theological gifts are working in us, converting us, helping us to believe, to hope, and to love more deeply. I had a similar experience, not like that, like my brother. My brother's was different. His experience was his according to his state life. My experience was a, a little stranger. I was being ordained. It was on my ordination day. And that was back in 1983, and I can't believe I'm still alive. <laughs> I'm still a priest. How did I ever do it? Wow. So I was lying on the floor. There's a part of the ceremony. It's beautiful. It's actually a very beautiful ceremony. And all of us guys who are getting more done, we lie on the floor. And it's supposed to be a symbol of our surrender to God. But I think it's more than that. I think it's more of a dying and a rising. It's a symbolic of sort of dying to self and rising to a new life in Christ. But whatever it is, we got to do it. So I was on the floor, and I was, I remember as clear as day, is these people in back were chanting, um, you know, St. Dominic, pray for us. Remember that, how that goes? You know, and St. Saint Francis, pray for us. St. Elizabeth Seton, pray for us. And they're singing this in the background. And, you know, I wasn't moved at all. I, I'm moved by it when I'm not being ordained. <laughs> when I'm in the congregation, I'm more moved. But when I'm getting ordained, I'm just lying there. And I think this is really nice. And the floor had green marble, and I was looking at the pretty green marble. <laughs> and I remember saying to the Lord, I remember, these words are still in my mind, I said, I know, Lord, that I'm supposed to be crying right now, but I'm not, I'm not crying. But I said, you know, um, I have no idea what's coming. I have no idea what's coming yet. And I'm sure it's going to be tough. I'm sure it's going to be really, really tough. But you know, I'm not worried. Uh, whatever it is, we will get through it together. And now that is the gift of faith at work in us. Nothing really that I did, but it's what God is doing in us. So I had no fear. And then we had 40 years of scandal, and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, priests are sometimes painted with a wide brush, you know, and we have to, we have to endure the steer, stares, people staring at us, wondering, and had to go through all that nonsense. But, you know, I was never afraid because it was the gift of faith within me, the power of God that helped me to know that he's there and he's with us and that he is helping us. And before I get to the Bible, I want to say one more thing. Um, the Lord gives us this gift of faith, which is a gift of sight. It helps us to see God at work. But it also helps us to see the good. The good in other people and the good in the world. Remember, don't fall into the trap that all is bad. Don't do that. Uh, we've talked about this in the past at other gatherings. Uh, the Lord created the world to be good, and the world created people in the world good. Everybody is created in the image of God, and there is good there. And so we know that there are struggles in the political world. There are struggles, you know, we'll look at a potential war over in the Ukraine, and we know that. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on, but the Lord wants us to remember 
And faith helps us to see it, that people are good and that they, they are created in God's image and that they're, they're fun. You know, people are good and they're fun to be with and fun to work with and that the world is good and that this is all part of his plan of salvation for us. And so we want to nourish the, um, the faith in our souls. I, I made a note of this. I just published an article last year with another colleague of mine talking about uh, social media and depression among teenagers. You know, it's a big, big problem. We got this published and we, we talked about how people and there's a lot of evidence of this. People spending a lot of time on social media can get depressed, especially kids, especially young women. Uh, they can get depressed by what they're seeing on social media. And for those who don't use social media, you might use TV. And so sometimes it's not a bad idea to sort of turn off the TV, you know, a little bit. Get away from a lot of the negativity that's out there and to control our use of social media. So, back to fear. So, what did Jesus have to say about fear? And so I have two biblical, uh, two biblical stories we're going to use today. Uh, one was from this week's reading, so it was on Tuesday. In fact, it was this reading that kind of got me started working on this talk, because I had to preach on that on Tuesday morning, and then another, another story that everybody knows. So the first one is about uh, Jairus and the hemorrhaging woman, right? So we all know that story, correct? Um, in, the, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, one to, verses 1 to 20, I think it is, um, Jesus had just finished, I believe he just finished feeding the 5,000, and he was making quite a name for himself. He was pretty popular back in the day, and there was a man, Jairus, who was the manager of the synagogue. The manager called it the ruler of the synagogue, but he just basically managed the church, make sure that everything was in place for when the rabbis came and all of that. So he was a, he was a good man working for the synagogue and his, his daughter was sick. And so he heard about Jesus and he went to Jesus. And he said, Lord, or Jesus, I have to go back and see Jesus. My daughter is very, very sick. Uh, would you pray for her? Would you lay your hands on her so that she can be well? And Jesus said, sure. Yeah. Yes, let's go. And so all these people heard it. So they all followed him. You know, so off they go, this big crowd of people to Jairus' house to see what Jesus is going to do. And on the way, we know that there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhaging for 12 years, which, by the way, is the same age as the little girl, 12 years hemorrhaging, 12-year-old girl. Hmm. It's not, not a coincidence that Luke uh, Mark mentioned that. And so, on the way, this woman, in her mind, is thinking, if I can just touch the prayer tassel, of Jesus. Now you've probably seen them. I see them in New York City all the time, like in the in the airports. The Jewish men have like a shirt on, and under from under the shirt they have these tassels, sort of like my rosary, here, and I think there are four of them, and so they're prayer tassels that they wear. And so the woman was looking at those tassels, saying, "If I could just touch that tassel, I will be healed." Now, where did that come from? Hey. Right. Exactly. Whoever said, who said that? <laughs> hey, well, way back there. Was hey. And she, there was the movement of the Holy Spirit in her telling her, go touch the tassel. Go touch the tassel. And what did she do? She responded to that call. Now, she was unclean because she had been hemorrhaging, so she wasn't even supposed to be there. She, she was supposed to be home, but she went anyways because the, the, the power of faith is moving her to Jesus. That's what this story is all about. Same thing happened with Jairus. 
Jairus is living his life and he's thinking, the Spirit is saying, go to Jesus. Go talk to Jesus. Go talk to him. He can help you. And so she responds. She goes out, touches the tassel. Jesus catches her. You know, he knew something had happened. He said, who touched me? And eventually, fear and trembling, she came to the Lord and said, I, I did it. And what did he say? He didn't scold her or anything like that. He just said, your faith has saved you. And so I thought to myself as I was reflecting on that reading this week, our faith saves us because it takes us to Jesus. See? It brings us to the Lord, just like Jairus, just like this, this woman. Your faith has saved you. And she responded to it. And Jairus responded to it. And we respond to it. When we don't respond to it, we'll see what happens in a moment. So now they finish the journey. They go to Jairus' house. And everybody is wailing. You know, it's interesting. When I was in Africa, I was talking to some Dominican priests out there. And they still have the practice of wailing and crying at the funeral or around the, the dead person. And so he, Dominican was telling me that some of them were kind of superstitious a little bit. And so they feel that, you know, if they got the evil eye or something, that might have killed them. So when you're there at the funeral, you have to make sure that you let everybody know how sorry you are that the person died. Because if you're not sorry, you might have had something to do with it. <laughs> and so the wailing and the wailing. And so Jesus walks into this, to this situation where everybody's wailing. And he said, what is all this noise? He said, fear is useless. What is needed is faith, right? You remember that. What is needed is faith. And sometimes I think uh, about all this wailing, and we, we see it in today's world. You see it on the radio, you see it in social media, you see it on cable TV. A lot of wailing, a lot of worry. Jesus says, easy does it, easy does it. It's not what's needed, what's needed is faith. And so, of course, Jesus reached out to the little girl, told her to get up, and she did. And St. Jerome, the great biblical scholar, comments on this. And he said, it, her being healed, her being raised to life, had absolutely nothing to do with her virtue. It was not the virtue of the little girl that had anything to do with her being saved. It was the faith of a father who reached out to Jesus. Amen. And I, amen is right. That's why I am saved today. <laughs> it's because of my mother and my father and the people who were praying for me. And so their prayers were so efficacious and so powerful. It was the prayer of those who love us, who saves us. So don't stop praying for those you love, especially if somebody is in trouble, having a difficult time. Do not give up. Keep praying. Keep praying for these people. It was the prayer and the faith of Jairus that raised that girl to life. Of course, it was the power of Jesus, but it was the faith of Jairus. He went to Jesus, brought her to Jesus, or Jesus to her, and things were changed. And so, what have I learned from this? Because I... When I went through this a second time, well, second time, I should say when I went through this story this time, this week, I was thinking to myself, and I share this with you, it takes an act of the will to respond to the movement of the Holy Spirit. You know? Jairus could have said, I don't have time, I gotta set up, I gotta set up church, you know, for a service tomorrow, I gotta do this. I, I don't want to bother him, but no. You know, he went and he did it. The, the hemorrhaging woman was not even supposed to be there, but she went anyways. And so we are called to respond to the gift of faith in our hearts. Respond to it willingly, openly, 
opening our hearts. Let me see. Okay. Sometimes people are moved to go to church on Sunday or go to church, period. And they say, well, I don't have time, you know. I've got a lot of things to do. And I think that sometimes people, it could be us, it could be us too, have a, uh, we fall into a false sense of security that no matter what I do, we'll be okay. And that is a way of, of not responding properly to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, don't fall into a sense of, a false sense of security. Be active, be aware, be awake. And when we feel the Holy Spirit moving, respond. If we're not sure it's the Holy Spirit, talk to somebody. Talk to somebody you trust. Say, is this the Holy Spirit or is this my imagination? What, what's going on? Or talk to a priest. Talk to somebody to help guide you through. But respond. Respond, respond. You feel the movement of the Spirit, respond to it. And then, as I said at Mass the other day, step aside and watch, watch what God will do in your lives. All right? Just step back and watch. It may take a while. So, that's my first biblical story, my reflections on that. The second one that I wanted to share with you this morning is the one everybody knows about. It's probably one of the most popular stories in the New Testament. And it's the story of Jesus and Peter walking on the water. Now, that, that's one of the, the New Testament's greatest hits. It's a, it's a great story. I love it. Uh, you know, I, it would have been so cool to be Peter and, and to experience this. I, I really would love to have seen that from a safe distance. <laughs> a TV, a real, real image of what had happened on the water, you know. Can you imagine what that was like? But the story, as you, I'm sure you're well aware, um, Jesus had been praying on the mountaintop and came down the mountain. Well, first he sent his disciples in the boat. He said, I'm going to pray on the mountain. You get in the boat. I'll meet you on the other side. Okay, so Jesus goes up the mountain. They get in the boat, and they're trying to get to the other side, and the wind's blowing against them, right? And so this has been an image for mystics throughout the years and artists being a symbol of our lives. You know, we're trying to make our way to paradise, and we're having all these headwinds and problems and temptations and all this stuff is going against us. And it's hard, and we're struggling as best we can. And, uh, you know, the boat is the church. You know, this is the boat right here, all these people in this room, you know. So you're all together trying to make your way. And the headwinds are against you. And so that's what was happening. So Jesus uh, came down the mountain for some reason. We don't know. He came down and went to the boat. And, of course, everybody thought he was a ghost. And so they, they shrieked, they cried out. And there was a young Dominican back at Providence College gave a homily on this talk. I thought it was so good. I, I repeat it all the time. You know, I don't always confess that it was his idea. I usually say it's my idea. Then I have to go to confession and it's just not worth it. So it was his idea, not mine. And he said, isn't it true that sometimes we face these headwinds in life and we, we fail to see Jesus in, in the troubles of life? We don't see him. That, that's the lack of faith. We don't see Jesus in the trials of life. We see Satan. <laughs> we think it's Satan. And that's what they thought. They thought that Jesus was Satan, was, was evil. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. These troubles you're going through, they're not from Satan. It's me. I'm here in, in these troubles that you're facing. I'm right in the midst. And I thought, wow, what a good insight this young Dominican had. But, you know, he was a Dominican, so I'm not surprised that he was having a little bit of that. But I thought, wow, what a great insight, you know, that Jesus is there. He's in the storm. And sometimes we don't see him. We don't recognize him. So that was my first thought. But then the second one was that Peter, he's in the boat, okay? He's the first one to respond. Now, 
All kinds of sermons are written, orally, in my opinion, that Peter was impulsive and jumped out of the boat without thinking. And I told you before, I do not buy that at all. What I think happened was that the Holy Spirit is working inside of Peter. And he's saying, gee, Liz, you know, if this is Jesus, I wonder if I can go up. The Holy Spirit is saying, Peter, go, 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 go out on the water. Not impulsive, but the movement of God. Go on the water. I mean, listen, it's one of the most popular stories we've ever heard. So the Holy Spirit moved him, and he went out on the water. He said, Jesus, if it's you, can I join you? What did Jesus say? Come on out. Come on out. If Peter was being impulsive, Jesus would have said, stay in the boat. <laughs> stay in the boat. I can walk on the water, but you can't. He said, no. Come on out, Peter. And he went out, and that's what I would have liked to have seen, you know. All kinds of jokes about that, but it must have been quite a sight. So it's, Peter's out there with Jesus on the water. And probably having a good time, who knows? I, you know. And But then, as we all know, uh, he, Peter got distracted. That's the problem. He got distracted. You ever been distracted when you're driving? See what happens? You know? I have scars, scars on my knees uh, when you're running. Sometimes you get distracted, like if you look over your shoulder to see if any cars are coming so you can cross the street, I can't tell you how many times I've fallen because you don't see the curbstone, the stick, the rock, or whatever in your way. Um, you really got to look quickly, <laughs> fast, back. Keep your eye on the road when you're running, when you're driving, when you're riding your bike, any of that stuff. Because when we get distracted, that's when we get hurt. And that's what happened to Peter. And that's what happens to us. We're doing fine. We're with the Lord. Everything's good. And then we get maybe a false sense of security. Don't have to go to church. Don't have to do this. It can wait. Or we get distracted. Got to do all this work. Don't have time to pray. Etc. As you can fill in the blanks, whatever your distractions might be. I've got mine, yours, and this story is warning us to avoid the distractions of life because they can bring us down, and they can bring us down hard. And we have seen, right, in the last 40 years or so, how. People who were doing fine have gone down because they got distracted with the cares of this world. They got distracted with success, fame, money, whatever, whatever it is. It can bring you down. We've seen bishops and cardinals, priests, lay people, you name it. Uh, it's just another one who got caught yesterday on the news. It's not, not priests, it's a lay person. They're caught with something had to lose his job. You know. And so, this is a reminder to keep our eye on Jesus. Keep our eye on Him. How do we do that? All right, it's easy to say, right? It, it, you know, the, these things make for great homilies. You know, I can dance around and you just got to believe. That's all you got to do. Makes for a great homily. Everybody's feeling good. You go out to dinner. And what are you going to do about it? How do we do that? How do we, how do we keep our eyes on the Lord? How do we keep ourselves from being distracted? You know, it's hard work in a way. It's fun, but it's hard. And so the Lord knows that. The Lord knows that it is difficult for us to keep our eyes on the goal, to keep our eyes on Jesus, to stay on the narrow path and not get distracted um, over time. And so he has given us a gift. Anybody know what gift is coming? What is the gift? Anybody want to take a shot? Prayer. 
Where? The sacraments. Mm -hmm. That's one. I sacraments are big as a special gift of the Holy Spirit. Prayer. Prayer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, it's because the Catechism didn't write much about it. It's called Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord? Let's talk about Fear of the Lord. Because I've been reading a lot about Fear of the Lord this week. And I'll tell you something. I, I, had, I mean, there wasn't much in the Catechism, so I guess, uh, I guess anything I say will be fine. <laughs> Maybe I should, maybe I should, you know, the Dominicans wrote the catechism, right? You understand that? So I got to contact that guy and say, you forgot to talk about fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. There's very little, just like a sentence or two. So that wasn't enough for me. Um, I, I want to know more about this fear of the Lord. I don't, I didn't know anything about fear of the Lord before this week. I should have, I, I, I hate to say it, but it's true. I didn't know that much about it. Didn't know that much about fear. Never really talked about it. So I spent this week looking it up, you know, in great fear, because I knew I had to keep this talk. I thought, Lord Jesus, <laughs> I have fear, fear of, 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 of not being prepared. So I thought, well, anyways. So I'm looking, and I'm looking everywhere. I, I listen to more homilies this week on fear of the Lord than I ever want to hear again. And you know, they just didn't do it for me. I mean, it really didn't. I, I thought, you know, it's okay. I even had a, a, a bishop, I won't name him, just a bishop. I don't know his name anyway. So. And he was giving this beautiful talk on, you know, the fear of the Lord is, you know, fear of his awesome power. And he's going on and on and on about how awesome and powerful the Lord is. I, was, I know that. Um, I, I'm a structural engineer, so I love buildings. I like to look at buildings. I, when I was at Berkeley, I used to go down to the Golden Gate Bridge and just look at it, you know? The beauty and the awesomeness of this Golden Gate Bridge. And I, I remember just sitting there for an hour looking at this thing. Saying, How does this work? How did they do it? And I, I was in awe. But I was not afraid of the bridge. I'm sorry, I wasn't afraid. Um, and I know the Lord is very powerful. But I'm really not that afraid of him. Like maybe I should be. Maybe I don't. I, I'm not afraid enough. And I was. Um, and this bishop was going on about how the power of the Lord, how powerful, how awesome. And I said, okay, got it. I got that. But I'm just not that afraid of him. So I, I thought, what am I going to do? And so I, I went online to do some research at Providence College. We can get our library online. And I'm going through it, and I just put in fear of the Lord. And lo and behold, lo and behold, I came upon this article. And it was written in 2015, just recently. And it was St. Thomas Aquinas, Understanding of Fear of the Lord. And I said, Hallelujah. St. <laughs> Thomas, I trust him. We're on the same wavelength. I thought, I wonder what he had to say, and I really didn't know, you know, it wasn't that much written on. So, I took a few notes for you, it's not, it's not, it's about a 20 page article, no, 13 page article, and I won't, I won't bore you. St. Thomas says there are three basic kinds of fear, okay, I thought, okay, I like it. He says, first fear is just instinctive fear, which we all know. So you're out in the street, you see a bus coming at you, you get out of the way. You know? Just the normal fear that we would all experience. He says the second kind of fear is the vice of fear. So the vice of fear is to fear something that you really should not fear at all. It's sort of like cowardice, you know, kind of being, you know, not like smallness of spirit is what St. Thomas said. And he said, that's, that's a vice. Like for example, a person might say, well, ah, I love my, I'll say a guy, I love my girlfriend and I'm going to move in with her, but I, I don't want to get married because the chances of divorce are so high that she might take my money and all this. So I'm just, I'm just not going to marry this girl. That would be a fear. That would be a vice, you know, because God, uh, marriage is a good that God wants you to have and to enjoy. 
and or it could be the fear of um, in many kinds of fears that um, might lack a little bit of courage. Let's see, uh, I'm not going to drive because I could get into an accident. So you never, never drive. And so there are many examples you can think of uh, where it's kind of like just being a coward, not, not chasing after things that are good for you. Good job. And then he said the third kind, which is what we're concerned about today, and he calls it filial fear. That's not filial fear. That's like the love of a person, right? Love of a brother or sister. And he said filial fear is what the Bible's talking about. And it is the fear of losing a loved one. Fear of losing a friendship. Fear of losing a child. And St. Thomas says, that's the fear of the Lord, the fear of losing the good life that we have with Jesus. And that's a gift. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, that's what this is really about. It's, it's based on love. And he says, you know, the saints in heaven don't have fear of the Lord. Because they've got them forever. See, they have them. They can't lose them. They're with the Lord forever and ever and ever. And they know that. So fear of the Lord disappears when we possess the Lord in heaven and in paradise. Well, fear of the Lord is given to you and to me. And as part of faith, you know, we, we see the good life that God has given to us. And we don't want to lose it. And I think about that often. I think, wow, you know, life is so good. Uh, I, would, I would hate to do anything to put that into jeopardy and to lose the good life that we have. And so the, there was a, a Dominican, a great Dominican priest called Garigou Lagrange. He's, I believe he's dead now, but he lived during the Second Vatican Council and uh, he taught at our seminary in, in uh, Rome. And he said, he used this image, that the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of one of which is the fear of the Lord, he said they're like sails, you know, in, on a boat. If you can imagine a really big boat with all these different sails on it. And he said the sails, each sail is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then the Holy Spirit is the wind. And so the Holy, so we have all of our gifts of the Holy Spirit all out there. And the Holy Spirit is moving us through treacherous waters. And so we're in the boat, and the Holy Spirit is moving us around the rocks and the, you know, away from the shoreline and bringing us to our destination. And I thought, wow, what a nice image that is. And so one of those sails, I mean, there are many, one of them is fear of the Lord. And so we have a good thing going for us. All of you have a beautiful thing going here at Women's Christian Fellowship. Uh, you have friends, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the sacraments that builds you up, and you don't want to lose it. And so it's okay to say, I'm not going to do this thing because it's going to put in jeopardy all the good that I have. And you can think what they are. You know, it's all, all kinds of examples. We avoid doing those things that endanger our relationship with the Lord. And that's a gift from God. So, that's all I have to say. Uh, fear, um, fear is uh, combated, is fought through the gift of faith that helps us to see God. We respond to the gift of faith working in us. We respond to it. And, and because faith is bringing us to Jesus, Who's the one who will save us? That's what this is all about. So when, when Jesus says, faith has saved you, what he's saying is, in other words, the, uh, the Holy Spirit is working within you, um, pushing your boat through the treacherous waters to the Lord. 
And that will save us. That will save you and save us because it brings us to Jesus. And that's what life is all about, really, in the end. In the end, you know, when paradise comes our way, uh, we're all going to join each other again in the next world um, to be with the Lord. And so uh, fear diminishes. Fear diminishes. And it's not fake and it's not phony. You know, you're not covering up your fear. Like my brother said, when he heard those words, this is the gift from God. He said, God, oh, okay, well, if it's from God, I guess I'll be all right. And the fears diminish. God removes the anxiety. God removes the fear. That's the work of God in your life. Our job, do the best we can to protect this gift. Just do what we can, acts of the will. I'm going to church. I'm going to receive the sacraments. I'm going to be kind to my neighbor. Acts of the will that nourish that beautiful gift that helps that helps us to see God everywhere, to see the good in people, to see the good in the world, to hope, hope more purely, hope for paradise, hope for good in the world, and to love more deeply, you know, to love with all of our hearts. That's it. Thank you very much. Wow. What a blessing. So now we're not going to be afraid. We're not going to be afraid of what's going on in our country or in our world or in our lives. So anyway, I was thinking about what Father had said, and I love it. one of the things that... Um, happened to me in Hawaii was that I went swimming with the manta rays and so at 10 o'clock at night the ocean's very dark and so I was I was in that vice the, the fear vice I think is what it was about. and am I going to actually jump into that ocean when it's so dark and I'm scared and so as I tried to get out of the boat get my big bottom out so that I could go over the side and everybody else was going over the side and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, Jesus, I trust in you. So <laughs> that is true. We fix our eyes on Jesus and that fear will leave us. But anyway, it was a fun thing. And so, but Holly stayed on one side of me and John on the other. So when the, they turned the lights on and the manta rays came, I could hear Holly screaming, ah! I got really close to you and they're really, really big. But anyway, it was fun. And, I had to let go of the fear, but the only way I could do it was getting my eyes fixed on Jesus. But you've given us a good talk, Father, to to really understand that that importance, I guess, is the very best thing, is to keep our focus on Jesus and let him give us that faith. He's already infused that faith. You mentioned that one thing um, the other day when we were talking about the faith, is that the Father, the Father image of Jairus was so powerful to, have, to believe that Jesus could be his daughter. And then, of course, Jesus raised her from the dead, but that, that was really awesome. But you mentioned it, and you likened it to baptism, the faith of the parents oh, yeah. who shared that with us. And that was so powerful because we have faith, and it's not the baby's faith, but it's the faith of the Father. And so our Heavenly Father has put that faith into us infused it into us and through the waters of baptism. So that was such a blessing. Thank you so much, Father.